Uh, this is the fourth in our series of uh, weekly artist talks. Um, and we're really grateful for the contributions of the artists and their participation in these talks. It's made for a really lively exchange in an ongoing uh, way, sparked a lot of thinking on my end. Um, <clears throat> today, I'm pleased to present and to introduce, and this is not necessarily the order of presentation, but I'm pleased to present Clarice Hill, Genevieve Quick, David Bayes, Surabi Saraf, Laura Splann, Christina Corfield, Mark America, Penelope Umbrigo, Daniela Sembieta, and perhaps others. Hope I got everybody. Uh, again, thank you for uh, joining us today. And Carla, who's going to start the program? Uh, so Danielle will start today. Terrific. Danielle? Okay, great. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. I am Danielle Simpieda. I'm going to start with sharing my screen. And uh, give me a second to set it up. Let's see. And um, sorry, it's uh, got these controls at the beginning. Great, awesome, you guys can see that? All right, so I'm gonna try to keep this uh, as five minutes. So I'll give you, show you four different works. Uh, and then um, of course, I think there's questions in chat and uh, at the end, so I, uh, uh, I can reserve this for later. So in, in the archive to come, I have two works and they're, they're a little bit older works. The first one is called Eco Elemental Archive. And this is, this is a concept, it is for looking at public art and how public art can contribute to collecting climate data. And the, the concept of this is that there would be these pallets uh, that had a material in them when you opened up each pallet, it would collect uh, content. So air particles, uh, water, insects, foliage, whatever from the air into these, these, these giant pallets. And those pallets can serve as an annual archive for what the climate and what, what was going on around the atmosphere for that particular year. They would be sealed at the end of each year and then stacked on top of each other, creating another uh, image and sculpture along with it, or they could be laid out flat, but they can be used for, uh, for centuries to come when scientists in the future are trying to look at basically similar to a coring sample of what was happening in any type of environment around that time. Um, this particular one was located for uh, San Jose. So thinking about what the Silicon Valley would be uh, connecting and, and acquiring in those particular years. Uh, so that data would, was created to be archived and preserved uh, as organic matter in a, in a, in a layered type of uh, palette. And this project uh, has never been realized. However, if there are any material scientists or uh, anyone who was working in forensics out there who would like to try to look at prototyping what type of material will collect that information over time, I'm happy to revisit this. Um, that's That was a, a really major missing piece to this is trying to find the right type of, of, of archival material that would actually allow for proper research for the future. So it's connecting art, science, and public art. Another um, piece that I have in the uh, archive to come is a collaboration with my uh, one of my partners, Robin Lasser. We spent a few years out at what's called the Albany Bulb in uh, near Berkeley, California. And on this site, there is a uh, a sculpture, well, it's actually a, a, a building, uh, they call it Mad Mark Castle, it still exists today. And this is a LIDAR scan of this. Uh, so we did a 3D point cloud scan of this structure along with other structures that looked at uh, the different architecture that was then destroyed is now destroyed on site, as well as the stories and narratives of the uh, 60 plus residents who had homesteaded on this particular uh, decommissioned landfill turned public park. Uh, most of the structures have been taken away. All of the people have been taken away. 
there still stands a few of the uh, uh, artworks on the site, but um, this particular one uh, was really resonated with me because it's still quite iterative and where a lot of graffiti artists come out and, and, and do work on, on the site. And the intention for this entire project was to take these scans and take the stories and submit them to the California Digital Archive and to GitHub for long-term preservation. So when journalists or planners or historians are coming through and trying to really talk about the evolution of that site, the 25 year period where uh, people did reside on it would not be lost in history. And we still haven't gone through the full process of submitting all these works and all these narratives to the California Digital Archive. But once those are up, I could also share more about that. But this um, was the idea of creating a cultural artifact that would be part of a long-term uh, understanding of the site. And then, oh, sorry, let me try to get to the next slide. So I, I'm gonna talk about a new project that I'm working on right now. I'm an artist in residence at the Genomics Institute at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, this particular one is, it lives on Instagram and it's using uh, facial mapping that you would create in those Instagram filters, uh, some deep fakes, um, GT3, uh, um, deep fake narratives that I'm, I'm creating. It's, it's a combination of reality, speculative fiction that looks at issues around CRISPR, around genetic science, around art and genomics. And um, this particular character or this persona that it's not necessarily persona, it's a, right now it's a Morpheus microbe that will be evolving over time and um, will actually change according to audience questions and audience, behavior, audience behaviors and people who I'm interviewing. Uh, so this will be something that over the next year or so, you'll see quite a bit of changes within this. Um, looking at the idea of influ uh, as an influ Instagram influencer, what does a microbe, what can a microbe do um, and how can that evolve and in what and what personas would that take on? So those who I interview, I will also create characters for uh, and masks for or, or other filters for and, and myself will change over time. So as you follow this project, uh, you'll be able to really um, see, see the evolution of it. Right now, it's also Mozilla Hub's uh, in the exhibition, What Makes Us Human, uh, put by the Cesson Gallery at UC Santa Cruz and the Genomics Institute of Open Lab. And then the last project uh, I'll talk about as well is called the Cultural Commentary Project. This is an open project for anyone, including yourself, to participate in. And the project is about intervening into the public policy process in which all of us uh, have a uh, uh, are, are affected by and anyone can comment to a public policy and that the, there are some parameters around this project and that is that you actually have to act, read the policy itself create artwork that reflects it not necessarily just the headline or an issue uh, that you really want to actually translate that text and then you can share it uh, on social media using just the hashtag culture com commentary project and create basically groups or social events to actually do this together. And I will be setting up some of those in the new year. And you will also be able to submit artwork as public comment. And this idea is that there will be some sort of forced curation among uh, policy creators and policy analysts. Uh, and hopefully that will help influence uh, the way that our, our laws or our rules are affecting us uh, in an artful way adding in uh, cultural components into it um, that are translated by artists from any form. And I think I've been about five minutes. Am I good? All right, cool. Um, so I wanna thank uh, the archive to come with uh, Carla and Clark for inviting me and um, on to the next speaker. Okay, Danielle, thank you so much um, for sharing generously all of those pro projects up these intersections of art, science, and public art. Really great. Laura Sklan, you're next. Okay, I'll share my screen. Um, and all right, hello. Um, Did we just get a freeze for a second? 
Yeah. <laughs> I think the world is closing. I think so. I'm sure someone's doing art about that phenomenon of the frozen <laughs> Zoom screen. <laughs> we'll wait a minute. Let me just text in case. Yeah, she may not know that she's Yeah. Working. She may not know. Of course, we can move back around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think she, is she rejoining? Hey, Laura, Danielle. you're back. Oh, Sorry Laura's about back. that. Um, <laughs> I don't know what happened, but I will yeah. proceed. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll try this again. Um, so you should be able to see my screen now. Um, okay, well, again, thank you, Carla and Clark, for including me in the exhibition. Um, I'm going to be presenting some of my interdisciplinary projects that mine the artifacts of biotechnology for poetic subjectivities. And my work attempts to destabilize and reframe our relationship with the everyday and even redefine what the everyday means. And I created this lay SARS doily in response to the first SARS outbreak in 2003. And this project was grounded in the intricacy of textiles and its associations with the familiarity and comforts of domesticity. And the series leveraged the conventions of the doily as an innocuous domestic artifact that traditionally references motifs from nature. So here, DNA, RNA, protein spikes, and lipid envelopes become unassuming decorative motifs. And collective, collective traumas born from disease are rematerialized in an heirloom artifact to be passed on from one generation to the next. And I often try to compel an intimate engagement with detail, calling into question how things are made and what they are made of. And I use processes and tools that challenge notions of what is made by hand and what is made by machine, what is natural and what is constructed. My studio practice often uses textiles, materialities and gestures to understand the structures that form our complex relationships with the biological world. In 2018, during an artist residency in a biotech lab, I was given over 200 pounds of wool from laboratory llamas and alpacas who produce antibodies called nanobodies for human drugs, including vaccines. And since then, I've been hand washing, carding, and spinning their wool into yarn. And I situate sculptures made with this hand spun yarn among other artworks that examine the hidden systems and invisible labor of biotechnology. And this work questions notions of the presence and absence of bodies evoking the mutability of categories that delineate their status. I often position both biology and viewer as protagonists within unfolding narratives informed by materiality interaction and embodiment. Lumen choreographs viewers movements to sit on a rug made with the wool of these laboratory animals. The lumen is the interior part of a cell where a protein is folded and modified. Sitting on the rug engages viewers with unseen materialities and labor of both humans and non-humans as they touch the yarn and listen to an accompanying soundscape that layers recordings made in a biotech laboratory. While I was processing the llama wool in my studio, I would often find clumps of feces, which I began to collect for this networked laboratory mixer that is agitated by Twitter. The device activates when Twitter hashtags associated with the culturally contested status of science are tweeted. Here, the mere mention of hashtag climate change or hashtag vaccination agitates tubes filled with laboratory animal feces. Since taking office, the Trump administration has advised how to improve the chances of receiving research funding with the suggestion to avoid phrases like evidence-based and science-based. As visitors exited this exhibition, Faint texts on a wall invited them to come close to read 
our distance allows our intimacy. The phrase refers to the complexities of existence in the biotechnological age where understanding of our own bodies and the bodies of others is increasingly mediated by technology. The sculpture blows a breeze in the viewer's face as they read the text. The speed of the networked fan intermittently adjusts based on the wind conditions near a farm in rural Pennsylvania. And this farm is actually the 600 acre biological laboratory that gave me the wool from the 2018 shearing of their llamas. And in January this year, they invited me for a tour of their sprawling facilities to meet and photograph the llamas. And not long after my visit to the farm, New York City went on lockdown for COVID-19. So while sheltering in place, I returned to some molecular visualization animations started during my biotech residency. And by using the specialized features of the software in unconventional ways, I create animations that are collaborative doodles of sorts between the software, my hand, and the molecular structures that are being disrupted. As the folded proteins are manipulated, the software renders uncanny disturbances in the form of sometimes spastic and sometimes sublime movements. My new animations continue to explore the unraveling and distortion of the folded proteins of viruses and antibodies. And this video is a 12 minute re screen recorded unraveling of a SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain in complex with a llama nanobody. I also started using the software's morphing feature to animate structures that I've been unraveling by hand I was interested in using the software as a continued exploration of interconnected systems as they are affected by both human and natural forces at macro and micro scales and increasing entanglements between natural and constructed worlds. I've been creating molecular animations with the SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins transitioning with their unfolded and unraveled forms that you see here. And this is an excerpt of Pandemic Panorama, which is included in the COVID-19 curated playlist on the Archive to Come online exhibition, um, which is on the Telematic website. And I'll share the link to that at the end. I've also exhibited these animations as projections with an immersive soundscape based on the nucleotide sequence at the end of the SARS, co uh, the SARS mRNA sequence. And for the soundscape, I invited biotech scientists and workers to play the nucleotide sequence on guitar in recorded Zoom meetings. And the undulating animations and their otherworldly guitar sounds inspired by the materiality of this devastating coronavirus are really at odds with the soothing experience that visitors have described as both meditative and womb-like. And I'll end it here, but I'll share some links in the chat where people can watch these videos and see the BioBat exhibition online. Um, so I'm gonna share those in the chat, but I'll stop sharing first. Um, so I'll just put those here. Thank you so much, Laura, uh, for sharing these really amazing and, and incredibly prescient that you were, you know, you've been working in this domain for so long, yeah. Yeah. Um, so next will be Clarice. Hello. Okay, let me start sharing. That was such a great talk. Let's see. Okay. Can everyone see everything okay and hear me okay? Okay, awesome. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me, Carla. Um, this is so much fun. I love talking about my uh, research. So I'm a practice-based researcher. So I do a lot of research and my research turns into art practice. Um, and that's how I've been working for the last three years. Um, so the piece that's in um, the exhibition is part of a longer research project called 
um, the heuristics of post-identity phenomenology through digitally mediated disruptions. That title is a little old, so I'm going to look over it <laughs> as I end the, um, towards the end of the research. So I'm almost finished with it. Probably in the next couple of months, I'll be done with this project. Um, so my project is pretty much um, an inquiry into what Western society and culture considers identity and how identity is formed and unpacked and performed and enforced um, and the categories of race and gender and all of those um, typical uh, benchmarks that we use to judge an identity and their performance based on if it's orthodox or um, unusual, I'm, I'm interested in these, why we consider ourselves who we are in this Western landscape. Um, so mostly I work in installations and this is um, an installation of meditation one. So my project unfolds um, from the standpoint of humanism. So I'm thinking about humanism through Sylvia Winter and how she talks about humanism and how uh, humanism became like the first heresy um, as in the Middle Ages, they turn from theology and being focused on theology as knowledge production to now art and philosophy and these other kind of like humanly centered uh, modes of uh, understanding the world instead of like relying on understanding the world from the cosmos, which is religion. Um, so this is meditation one and mostly I work in um, installations and I print on silk and I uh, created um, the guide out of, from the beginning of this project, which started about three years ago in January, I created the guide. So the guide, the guide's archive, which is in the show, is pretty much what the guide, the body, and the researcher has learned um, through their time together. So the body is a marginalized body, um, a precarious identity in the Western society. The guide is the critical theory. So my research takes um, black, black feminist critical theory, um, post-colonial studies, black studies, uh, Caribbean philosophy. So Sylvia Winter, she's a Car um, she's from Jamaica, so she um, falls into Caribbean philosophy and really thinks about how to disrupt the identity performance. So instead of the performance being verified and anxiety coming from the performance not being verified, I'm more interested in intentionally disrupting the performance in order to transcend time, space, and the performance. Okay. So that's a close up of the installation, and the meditations happen on an altar, which is a space that invites you to sit down and have a like and to take in the meditation haven't really done one of these this year because of covid but it's okay <laughs> so now everything happens online and i'll show you how i manage that in in another in the in the last piece so disruptions is the first meditation and i'm going to show a little snippet of it just so you can get an idea of the materiality of the guide um, which is an imperfect representation of a body and how the guide invites the viewer to go on a journey of unraveling and disruption. And that journey happens in three moments. So disruption is the first moment and then fissures is the second moment and then rupture is the third moment. Can everyone hear it? No? It might have been on the share if you didn't press the audio button, Clarice. I you were... thought I did. Okay, let me just try this again. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't work through um, Keynote. I've had that problem. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay, let me try. Especially if you haven't turned off your computer in a little while, which is me. <laughs> is it better now? Can you guys hear it now? I can hear it now, okay. Oh, 
Oh, sorry. I invite you to take a journey with me out of the zone that you feel most comfortable, waking up the subconscious creature that sits in the back of your knowing, experiencing, interacting, living, performing, your existential human essence. For this journey, you must be firmly planted on the ground, not the one under your feet, the one where you feel the most comfortable right side up, but the ground that emerges with your steps. You order its place under your body, not the other way around. You place. Sorry. Oh my goodness. Having a computer crisis here. Okay. Um, sorry, my. Is it a new computer? So I'm having a little struggle here. <laughs> um, okay, there we go. So. I can drop links to this so everyone can watch it and enjoy it if you'd like. Um, the second moment is fissures. So in the first meditation, you see the guide and the guide interacts with thermal footage. So I'm interested and the scan that is rotating is my head that's not clearly scanned properly because I'm not reflective enough for the scan to scan me properly. So it's about intentionally sitting in this disruption and this lack of legibility and being comfortable with it and thinking about how do we measure the body and how do we like measure representations of the body and how these representations are uh, algorithmically um, generated and created and are told to be you know this scanner structure scanner I think mostly everyone has used it's like oh it's so precise it's like maybe not <laughs> um so that was so the the guide is made up of that materiality I, I also perform as the guide which we'll see at the end and um and in the piece in the archive I perform as the guide so this second piece is about um creolization so my first meditation is based on Sylvia Winter and the second one is based on Edward Edward Glissant and how he thinks about um, creolization so, and poetics. So it's about how do we, okay, now that we've realized our identities, how do we learn how to live together through our difference and observing difference? Photosynthesis. The harvesting of sunlight to produce energy is the ultimate driver of virtually all life on the surface of our, of your, of us. Sitting at, at the intersection of globalization, capitalism, the anthropocene, and ideologies of difference. The outreach to students, students and the Western, Western world is at the center. The hyperbolic laser focus of these problematic forces propagates the systems towards objectives of friction, division, and adjacent tactics. Let's, Let's observe how, how difference has created a global crisis. A lack of communication at the heart of it all. Climate change, racial issues, poverty, food insecurity, gentrification, and, and all of the problems that the Western narcissism has regrettably shared with the rest of the world. Drawing the aisle of a multifaceted societal destruction in the global circle. Learning to live side by side, sharing ecology is not the rhetoric of Western societies that are interested in collecting and exerting power with all of the implicit epistemologies. Citizens of these societies are told to create fissures between humans occupying the contiguous landscape. The quality of category of difference establishes a monolithic perversion of universality. And so that meditation um, is supposed to be experienced like meditation one at an altar, but for now it's just living online um, as it has been made in 2020. 
And uh, so I really like kind of unpack Glissant and tangential thinkers um, like Catherine Youssef and um, Ashil Membe and um, um, so uh, back to Sylvia Winter because she talks, I, I reference her as well. And um, to kind of like think about what does it mean to observe difference, sit in discomfort and overcome difference. So Glissant talks about a right to opacity. So it's the right to difference. And that's pretty much, the, that's the second moment. So that's fissure. And this is rupture. So this is the performance that I just did, which was a 360 stream. Um, and this performance, I, cause I do these performances and it's really hard because I really like everyone together. So it was this, this problem solving um, tactic with, technology and with this with the gallery space that I did the performance in to really think about how to bring people who are not able to come to the space into the meditation so we did a 360 stream so this is a poor documentation of it <laughs> and this meditation included a 360 stream and then had portals so this is something that everyone experienced together. And if you were in the gallery, you had to go onto YouTube and, you know, go into the portal. So it was an opportunity for everyone to come together. Um, this meditation uh, combined, well, this transmission, which is, which they accompany the meditations, they're how the meditations are activated, um, combines Glissant, Sylvia Winter, and, um, Christina Sharp and um, Alexis Pauline Gums and a bunch of other theoretical um, influences on my research into one like 40 minute piece. And I can also drop a link to that as well. Um, so this is pretty much the conclusion of this project. The meditation that goes along with it, which I have not finished, will be the end of this moment of this project. But identity and identity theory is something that I am will probably research for a very long time because it's very fascinating, especially in these very strange times. Thank you. Maurice, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing the guide and all of your research, your important research and your practice. Um, Claudia, you're next. Hi. So um, I'm going to show in the background uh, I, uh, the, a channel of a three channel piece that's called The Ruins that is an archive, actually literally an archive as Carla and I have discussed. That's why I chose it for this. And um, it was the centerpiece of a show that I did um, in New York at Bitform's Gallery that just came down at the end of October and is now currently um, up in London at, at, at Gazelli. Um, so this work is an audiovisual work. It, 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 it's a centerpiece, meaning I made show, given the name of it, I gotta turn on my, my five minutes, um, giving it its name because it is the meaningful, most meaningful work I feel in this body of work that I made. And um, I'm an audio visual artist and this is a three channel piece and I've silenced it so that I can talk over it. So I'm gonna start now and I'll just give a mini, a mini about it. Do you still hear me? Can you see? Wait a minute, I have to escape this. Was that working? Not seeing the screen yet. Oh, shit. Did I not say share screen? Oh, no. I didn't. Here you go. You got it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. How's that? Is it working? Is it there? How is it now, Carla? It's good. It's, it's great. It's full screen. Looks amazing. All right, good. So um, the ruins came about. Uh, because when the show was planned and we got COVID, 
And it wasn't clear that I was going to be able to do a show in a gallery. And my gallerist saw an article in the Times about a game called Occupy White Walls, um, which was a gallery building game uh, run uh, produced by a guy in London where players can um, collect art, build their own gallery and collect art. And the art comes from all of the um, uh, great museums of the world, downloaded off the internet in their copyright free versions that many institutions offer high resolution scans of uh, work that is not no longer copyright protected. And the guy whose name is Yardin Yavlowski was extremely interested, he owns uh, the company, in showing me because a number of the works within this body of work were sort of riffing off of Matisse. And he told me that um, his players would love, he would love to have Matisse in his archive, but he couldn't because it's copyright protected. And the uh, museums like the Tate and the MoMA will not release the images. So if he couldn't have them, he thought, he could have me because I was free. And um, I would be so happy to give him my copyright. This is what happens when you put the stuff in the game. At first I was really delighted because, hey, um, I'm a three, um, I work with simulations and I thought it was cool. And then as I started to think about it a little further, um, I started to feel very nervous because it evoked um, Facebook and Google Earth and all of these large corporations that exploit their players for content and, um, and who don't make any money and they do. Their goal is actually to make as much money as they can. So I, I pulled out, I decided not to do it and inspired by that and also by readings that I do with my students. And this was um, for, uh, oh no, now I just blanked out on her name. Who wrote, um, who wrote The Poor Image? Uh, you know what? What? Peter Styro. Yeah, so he chose famous essay on The Poor Image. I thought I would make a poor copy myself um, in game land, as I was emerging from, I decided in playful copyright infringement and a playful idea of uh, making a forgery, I copied very carefully models um, uh, that I had used in my works for Matisse and for Picasso and uh, all the grand masters copying their brush strokes. And uh, they were a very labor intensive process, layers of paint and all that. Um, so in doing that, I, when I decided not to go forth with uh, Occupy White Walls, I decided to build my own game. Um, and it would be, uh, at this point, we had the Black uh, Lives Matter uh, uprising. And I started to feel that it was time for me also to reconsider the patriarchs of my own culture. And I was thinking then about creating this labyrinth, how oppressive and in, almost impossible it seemed to be able to escape, escape these patriarchs and great histories. And I decided to make a labyrinth, which you could not escape. So it's actually, you can go in and you can never get out. And I would fill it up with these uh, copyright infringement models that I'd made. Um, oops, that's my five minutes. So um, I, uh, and I did that. And also integral to this work is um, the audio, which you can't hear. And I would like to just play it for a minute when I shut up, which is about in one second. Um, in keeping with critique of the patriarchs or you know, presenting the patriarchs as the framework of a kind of prison, I uh, performed uh, Thomas Jefferson, a letter on democracy, um, uh, Walter Gropius's Bauhaus Manifesto, um, uh, uh, Henry Ford's uh, Fordlandia uh, Manifesto, which was about a uh, um, rubber factories that he built on the uh, Amazon where he had laborers, uh, imitations of Detroit suburbs where he had his laborers, indigenous people eating hamburgers, hot dogs, french fries and donuts and an enforced diet and watching 
newsreels. And then finally, Jim Jones, um, who was the drink the Kool-Aid guy. And I performed them orally. And then Ed Campion, um, who's the director of CINMAC, made a software for me in which we mixed them as a kind of musical instrument. So I would like to play it for just a second. That's all I have to say. If I can escape out of this, which I am, this one, I will play maybe 30 seconds, or maybe I won't. Should I pay for, should I play like 30 seconds of the audio? Please. Yeah. All right. All right. So, because I, I don't want to infringe on the five minutes, but here, if I can get here. All right, I'm gonna play another one that actually has the audio. And it's this one. Now I have to figure out how to share it, but let's see. No audio. audio. What? No audio? No audio. No audio? Oh, shit. All right. So I can hear it. Oh, yeah, of course. You can't hear it because we're sharing interface. And that what that means I can't play. But you can, can you hear it like now? No. No, but maybe if you drop a link, so that, just so that everybody could experience yeah. it, you know. Yeah. Now you, can well, you hear it? Now you can hear it. Wait a minute. The version um, that's on Telematics website, of course, has the soundtrack. Yeah, so, all right, yeah. so that's better. And it's, it's yeah. a key piece. What? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's spooky. It sounds like, yeah. it's, it's sort of devilish and weird. Mm -hmm. So I think it's sort of central to the piece. It's more an audio piece than a vid video, but, or mix which is sort of the norm for what I do. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Claudia, thank you so much. And, um, and, and thank you for sharing the ruins with us and the oppressiveness of the patriarchy. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, Mark, you're next. Great. Well, it's great to be here uh, and seeing all this wonderful work. I'm wait, kind wait, of blown away. Oh, I'm blown away, I have to say. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think Claudia is still sharing. Yeah, I have to yeah. share. Oh, you're good. That's okay. Take your time. Wait a minute. Where is my... Uh, I somehow can't access the mouse. It's not letting me unshare. Can you unshare me, Carla, as a... Um, there, you did it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or someone did. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, Mark, it's you. Great. So uh, thanks to uh, Clark and Carla for, for putting together this really wonderful uh, intercultural, intergenerational, intermedia exhibition of artists. Uh, I've been sort of just blown away by all the work and uh, was thinking about how all of us working in digital media art contexts are producing stuff that you know clearly has this what is now this uh, has its roots in this now long history of uh, practitioners. You know, going back, I'm looking at the you know the Stuttgart algorithms from the early '60s through the work of pioneers like Vera Molnar and Lynn Hirschman, you know, as well as the artists who just spoke before me, the wonderful Claudia Hart and our own curator Carla, and uh, and yeah, all the artists producing uh, work for the archive to come, and. And for me, you know, I, I'm a writer in addition to, you know, being a filmmaker and a digital artist, performer, et cetera. Um, all of this work connects with other group shows that I associate with uh, breakthrough exhibitions, actually, like the 60s uh, Cybernetic Serendipity at the ICA that was in London and uh, the software exhibition at the Jewish Museum in, in New York all the way through the, uh, some of you may remember the Whitney Biennial 2000 when we first were encountering the inclusion of net art to what's now kind of the wide distribution of artists showing in, in galleries like 
postmasters up for transfer bid forms, and of course, uh, telematic. So uh, my own small dis uh, my own small contribution to this exhibition uh, is a video performance or video poem from a much larger project titled Fatal Air, subtitled Artificial Creative Intelligence or ACI. And it's a transmedia artwork that includes live performances, uh, standalone video and uh, sometimes interactive installations, uh, scientific papers and presentations, as well as uh, books of poems. And if I may say super wiggy art theories that double as uh, speculative fictions on the future forms of AI. And so uh, lately a question that I've been asking myself, even after all these years of producing new work across the intermedia spectrum and getting it out into the world is uh, where does it all come from? Uh, I don't know if you've ever asked yourself that question, but where does this stuff come from? Uh, that is the stuff that, that we create collectively, trans uh, individually. And uh, so it's a question that I, I asked in this keynote Zoom uh, performance that I gave at the Artificial Creativity Conference in Malmo, Sweden, just a couple of weeks ago. And it was something that we had rehearsed and created in the, in the Techne Lab here at uh, CU Boulder with my collaborators, Laura Kim, who's here and is also in the show. I'm sure you all were tuning into her presentation a couple weeks ago and uh, Brad Gallagher. And so I thought I would share my screen since they recorded that and just play the opening few minutes of that performance as a way to end my brief intro and, and give you kind of an overview of how it, how it works into that kind of environment. Our idea was to try and, uh, let me see, I'm gonna try and just share a screen here. Can you see it okay? Yeah, so I'll just play a little bit of it for you. Hopefully the computer sound, I did click it, so hopefully it'll, uh, it'll work. And, uh, and so basically what I'm doing is I'm reading some script that we, uh, that we created or that I created basically that I wrote for this 3D avatar that we call the ACI. And, uh, and the idea was to try and come up with this live three channel installation uh, performance as a keynote within the Zoom environment, which we had never done before, and I'm not sure anybody has. And so uh, it, it turned out pretty interesting. Let's let's check it out. You won't get to hear much because uh, of course we don't have a lot of time, but I can send you a link to the whole thing if you want. This is Fatal Air, Artificial Creative Intelligence, ACI. I wanted to give birth to an artificial creative intelligence, a psychic automaton whose operational presence came preloaded with an otherworldly aesthetic sensibility. A shape-shifting information sculpture modeling the kind of embodied praxis that only a lover of stylistically adventurous literary fiction would dare interact with, meaning that it, the artificial creative intelligence, the ACI in me, would be trained to bring to light whatever dark holes were already circulating in the innate machinery of the mediumistic 
being ready to be exploited. But lately, I have been feeling so corrupted by the mere threat of contagious media that I can't help but imagine system exploitation as a kind of self-exploitation. That's not to say that I, the machine, the poet, the avatar, the artist, the persona, the author dysfunction have a self, or if I do, that it's truly systemic in nature. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, the basic intro. And then as, as the performance goes on, of course, the the figure on the right starts randomly uh, engaging in a kind of dialogue with me and we play off of each other. I don't know what it's gonna say. And then it becomes this, uh, this strange uh, uh, digital <laughs> ventriloquist act. No, not really that, but if you've, ever, if you've ever seen the Twilight Zone episode with Cliff Robertson called The Dummy, you, you might get, have an idea of like what it feels like to work with this figure over time. Uh, so I'll end it there. That was about five minutes. Thanks, Carla. Mark, thank you so much. Um, yeah, your performance is pitch perfect. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I got the uh, pleasure to watch a little bit of this when you shared uh, a couple weeks ago. So congratulations on that. Okay, so next we have Serapy. Unmute myself. Thank you so much. <laughs> for that really amazing, it's so hard to kind of follow Mark and everyone else, but so many uh, overlaps and, and intersecting themes and ideas that uh, I'm so inspired. Um, but before I officially start, which I kind of have, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you all see it? Yeah, okay, got it. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Serbi and I am a media artist as all of y'all. Uh, and so my, my, I will just give a very brief background about my practice, which is, you know, I explore uh, our complex relationship with technology using embodiment as a tool and a body for, uh, as a site for transformation. And uh, in my practice, I am often pulling from my background in experimental sound, somatic movement practices, Indian classical music, activism, and my deep love for cognitive science to deepen my understanding of the inner workings of the human mind. Um, and another through line that you'll see in a lot of my works, uh, some of which I'll share today, is this idea of the collective and the ethos of collaboration and creating spaces and experiences for co-thinking, co-learning, healing, and collective action is, is just integral part of my process. So the works I wanna to show today, um, you know, are, are basically the larger world of which the, the one piece uh, that is in the show is part of. Um, and it's the, the larger project is called uh, Awoken the Awoken. And, um, you know, as a lot of my works, they take a lot, like it's a multimedia project. I started this project in 2018. Um, currently it's kind of on a pause. I'm like not actively working on it, but in a way I'm also actively working on it, but it's, uh, it's the most, I, I would say is like the most intimate and personal work I've ever made. And I'm still gonna continue working on it for a few years to come. Um, so yeah, at the intersection of all these different uh, interests and mediums and backgrounds, um, 
I again started the project called Awoken Awoken. And um, what we're going to look at today, oh, sorry, um, is I'm going to turn the sound off. Okay, the sound is already off, looks like. So, what you're looking at is the blob, and it is Awoke, which is the other part of the Awoken, which is also the video in the show. And you'll see a little bit more of it. Um, and so, I'll just let this blob run when I talk about it, but Awoken Awoken is an ongoing multimedia project that includes a video, sculpture, a VR experience, and a series of live performance, a short film, and a cops concept album, a lot of which are still in the process. I, I feel like I'm in the very first stage of, you know, getting deep into this project. And the research and development of this project is very directly tied to and inspired by uh, and kind of rooted in my uh, collaborative project. It's called Center for Emotional Materiality. And hopefully I'll have some time to talk about it at the very end. Um, um, but this project in particular is, is uh, kind of engages in this poetic storytelling. Um, in the act of waking up to imagine a technological future that privileges um, human and non-human agency above all. So the techno-utopian myth of Awoke and Awoken is centered around the relationship between this artificial, uh, mythical artificial emotional intelligence, which is this blob um, and, uh, I wanna turn the sound off, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. So it takes the form of this sculpture and again, it examines uh, kind of questions, the general theme of the project is that it questions the risk and possibilities of technological solutionism um, as like the kind of primary ideology of, in Silicon Valley and its implications on our emotional lives. It particularly looks at uh, developments in AI through an allegorical lens and engages in this exercise of collective myth-making, trying to get an outside view of ourselves as humans. So that's generally where I'm coming from. Uh, and of course, I also started this project after living in the Bay Area for 10 years and, and kind of living that, breathing that air of um, the valley. Um, so what awoke is, I'm gonna, Continue that, sorry. Oops, yeah. Um, what a way, oh, and then I have like this clear uh, story around it. It's again, like a lot of my work kind of, a, I feel like I'm driven by uh, getting to the bottom of things, like getting to the core of where does it all start. So it's a lot about the stories and beliefs and where they're coming from and reconstructing those stories and beliefs for this new context that we're in. Um, so the story of a world goes such as that it is a blob that comes from the earth. It's made of all the different minerals and metals that are that are uh, go into the making of our iPhones and our all our digital technologies. And it takes this form of uh, this living, breathing intelligence that lives on this in this sculpture. And what it can do uh, for its believers who are the awoken, it can like perform emotional labor and helps them build endurance against anxieties like FOMO and, and it really appreciates the human vulnerability. Um, and uh, yeah, and it only communicates through movement um, and there's no, there's no real language. So it's kind of really taking that embodied understanding of how exploring this concept of like, I feel therefore I am and kind of re-centering from I think before I am how which is kind of so embedded in so many of our institutions and how they're all built up um, so again changing that that idea uh, trying to shift that uh, understanding to an inquiry of, of the body and this is where the awoken comes in and I don't since this is in the show I'm going to maybe like play 10 seconds of that sorry um, Oh, maybe I don't have the video of it. I guess that's for better because I don't, <laughs> this isn't the show, but this video was essentially just like a quick sketch for me of like what the people who are the believers of uh, this AI um, technology would look like, would, would act like, 
And it's really just like a little trailer or like a mood board of some kind uh, of what they, they would be and which is what is in the show. And then um, uh, this project was launched in San Francisco in 2000, uh, again, 18, as part of the, the larger project Center for Emotional Materiality, which is where we did this performance. Again, very, very first like preliminary, preliminary performance of like the shape-shifting ritual uh, that the Awoken perform. And so I'll tell a little bit about the Awoken, which is, uh, you know, they Awoken, again, the character, these people, they live in the techno emotosphere, which is a, a world that I have <laughs> kind of coined. Um, it's a reality that is focused on extracting our emotional data from uh, our interactions with machines. And the Awoken embody all the contradictions of the postmodern states of hyperconnectivity and their entanglement with technology that, bring, that it brings into their life. Um, the Awoken have the ability to think with their bodies. They have their special, and that's why it, you know, um, it makes them especially receptive to Awoke's non-verbal modalities of communicating. And the, the film or the series of short films is, uh, which, is which are to come are again to, uh, the idea is to document their becoming uh, as they set out to find and connect with the woke. And on these, in this journey, they encounter six emotion sensing technologies that analyze their voice, text, facial expression, galvanic skill responses, eye movements and gestures. And the Evoken use each of these interactions um, to look inward and create new rituals to cope and appreciate and like cope with their vulnerabilities and appreciate their vulnerabilities. So essentially like over time, this project has become more and more for me about just really examining these two emotions, um, which is vulnerability and how it comes with courage and, um, and fear, which is, you know, fear of missing out is essentially a fear of like something that is not here. So uh, this year I have been really just kind of taking a pause from like actively working on the, on the project and working more on myself and like trying to figure out what spiritual awakening can look like and feel like and uh, really understanding how these things live in my body and how this project lives in my body. And this is kind of where I'm at. Uh, and some more images. Uh, how much time do I have? I sorry, didn't put a timer. I haven't been timing people. Okay. I, I didn't want to interrupt anyone, but probably drawing it to a close. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'll I'll end with this uh, this short like video. Basically, it's like you, we can watch like thirty seconds of it. But it's essentially this is the last part, which I was talking about. Um, uh, a concept album and this is where it started it's it, which is uh me performing the genesis of awoke through like sound and sonic explorations and we'll just uh listen to that for a second no sound It's because of headphones. That's why mine didn't work either. Because it's in her Oh, you can't hear it? Yeah, I heard a subtle sound. So I was you thinking to, the subtle you to, sound. You have to take your headphones off and play oh. it through the, uh, let it come out of the speaker of the computer. That's uh. why mine didn't work. Okay. Um, can you hear it now? That, that did it. That did it. Oh, wait. Sorry. Now we're on the different. Ah. Okay. So that's about it. That's yeah, it's a long uh, performance and we just saw 10 seconds of it and I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah.
Thank you so Thank much, you so Sophie. Much. Yes. And um, I feel, therefore, I am. I'm just going to repeat that over and over again. Uh, fantastic work. Okay, next, Penelope. Okay, um, I'll share my screen. Oh, stop. I'm, sorry. So stop it. Stop share. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. You can see it. All right. So I'm trying something new. I'm showing a um, a Moreau board. Um, this is the piece that's in the show right now. I don't know if it's like a an embedded link from. Me out here. <laughs> it started, um, it, it's a part of a larger body of work um, that started in 2006, actually, and, you know, very non-technical in some ways. I was, I was researching what was the most photographed subject in the world, and Sunset at that point had been on Flickr, so... Um, I went to Flickr and downloaded all these sunset images and wasn't really sure what I was gonna do with them until I realized that the sun, you know, there's like one sun in the world. And there were, at the time, there were 54,000 images of, this, of suns, uh, sunsets on Flickr. And I thought that was just phenomenal. I made snapshots of them, put them up on a wall. And um, I, I didn't title it this, this is how many there were in 2006, but in the next year in 2007, there were 2,303,057 sunsets on Flickr. And I, I just thought, okay, well, that's phenomenal. In 2007, that seemed really phenomenal. So I decided to title each installation. These are different installations um, at this point. There's 48 million, which doesn't seem phenomenal at all anymore. It just seems normal. Um, but uh, the thing about this that was fascinating to me is people would ask me, like I, I was interviewed once about this project, um, what, is the, what does it feel like to photograph the sunset secondhand through other people's images, um, assuming that my subject was the sunset. And I realized uh, there was this clear um, misunderstanding about what the work was actually. The, the work was about the value um, or currency of an image online, how, how people make and share images. What does it mean to share images online and see them then online, not the subject of the sunset. Um, and that led to thinking about the fact that all of these people that are looking at this work, so these are images that I've collected, or th these are images that I've, I've collected of people standing in front of my work as though they're in front of the sunset themselves. Um, all of these people are looking at images of, well, they're photographs now, but the original photograph was on the screen. So these are images of screen light, not sunlight. Um, and it's something that uh, led me to this project I won't talk about, but did lead me to thinking about, well, what does it mean to see the world through a screen? What does it mean that all of our natural um, the things that we, we, we understand as being natural um, we're, we're, are being subsumed to these web, plat web platforms and screens and we're, we're getting all the, all the stuff that would be normally reflective light or natural light seen through screen light. So I started taking screens apart. I made a project where I, um, I scanned uh, the screens that I took apart on a scanner when the sunlight was shine, shining through so that you got the sun. It was like a photogram of, of sunlight. Um, the scanner light and the sunlight meet right in the middle in the screen and they reveal all these fingerprints. You can see here, um, this was an installation of multiple screens, a kind of typology and archive, as you will. <laughs> I also scanned a screen and this is actually a little performance right here. This is a screen. Let's go in close to this one. Um, the performance of a screen on screen. So this is an image of a, this is a scan of a monitor screen. And as I scan out, the moray patterns that happen are the result of a conflict between my laptop. Can you guys see the moray patterns? Yes. So they're the result of my laptop screen and the screen that was scanned. 
and it, they get to be really incredibly beautiful and, and kind of com complex. And um, are you still seeing them change? So I was really fascinated by this. I've always been fascinated by moray patterns. And um, I never really let myself do anything with them just because they're so beautiful. And I just didn't want to, I don't like to make work that's just beautiful. It has to have a, um, some kind of reason for being other than its beauty to me. Uh, it's just my own thing. So, but at this point I was realizing this is, this performance that we're seeing here is screen talking to screen, which is actually the condition of pretty much everything that we're doing these days. Um, right now you're looking at a screen that I'm looking at. We're not looking at each other. So that became a body of work where I just screen grabbed all the different mores. Even as I go back and forth with these, they, they're changing. But um, screen grabbed all the mores. And um, I had this big installation in Switzerland with all the more images. And that also led to taking screens apart uh, thinking about what it meant to be inside the screen. So here's some kids sort of playing with the screen inside it, um, photographing the sunlight through the screen, which is an inversion of how we normally experience the screen. And then uh, this piece, which is the piece that's in the show. And I'll just play it for a second and, and talk over it. Um, and it's basically, um, no, of course, now it's going to be, yeah, there we are. So it's basically images of the sun that I cropped from sunsets from Flickr. And then I put them into, I mean, it's just so low tech, it's incredible. <laughs> I put them into um, photo authoring or sort of video, like, like Premiere actually, which is a video authoring software. And I made a dissolve between each of the images so that you couldn't, this, the dissolves are completely overlapping. So no one sun is um, ever visible there. They're an amalgamation of each other. And then I played that video and then re-recorded it with my iPhone. So my iPhone is now recording this and the, the pixel grid of the iPhone is conflicting with the pixel, well, the pixel sensor, the video sensor of the iPhone is conflicting with the pixel grid of the screen and creating this more pattern, which basically makes the sun dissolve in and out of the screen. Um, so that's what that, that piece is about. And I'll stop there. I mean, I, I could, I don't, I think that might've been about five minutes, right? Um, I, another project that came out of that is this piece, which came from images of prints of clouds and thinking about the screen as a kind of filter itself. And then the paper images of clouds being the complete opposite of what clouds actually are. So I created this video that, um, that uh, is of paper images of clouds, but you see it on the screen. So the screen and the paper and the, the crap that's on the paper, like the, the um, what is it, the decay, because these are very old, old archival photographs. Um, they all kind of mix together and I create this kind of brand new cloudscape with them. And you can't really, it's, it's very, very slow moving. So it's like one cloud moves into another before you actually realize that you're seeing a different uh, so slowly that sometimes it's impossible to see them moving. If you look away and then come back, you'll see that it's different. <laughs> All right, so that's it. Thank you so much, Penelope. Uh, phenomenal phenomenological, I can't even say the word for it, but I mean, uh, yeah. Well, also, and I want to thank you. I meant to say this at the beginning. Thanks so much for inviting me, you and Clark. And also these, all the talks have been so interesting. So it's great to be a part of. I so enjoy these talks where we really start to unpack, you know, each of your individual practices, but see all of these intersections too, between the works and the different ways that you all approach the archive too in your, your practices. Um, Genevieve, you're next. Is Genevieve here? Yes. Her audience off. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. Awesome. Okay, uh, okay let me share my screen. Wait, is it the screen? Uh, let's 
see here. Uh, oh, wait. Why would I do that? Oh, shoot. Um, I am going to have to, it's popping up in a different window that's not allowing me to see Zoom at the same time. I'm not really sure why, but uh, let's see here. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> we all share this condition. <laughs> Okay, so um, the work that I have in the show um, is part of a body of work called Planet Celadon. Um, and this is a body of work that attempts to um, talk about the Asian, di Asian American diasporic identity issue uh, through a scientific narrative. Um, uh, as Asian Americans, we're always asked, where are you from? Um, well, I've decided that um, we are literally from Planet Celadon, uh, which is a reference to um, Celadon ceramics, which are widespread throughout East Asia, um, China, Japan, and Korea. They all have very strong traditions of Celadon. Um, and so this all came out of uh, this moon jar. Okay, uh, this, is, this was originally a piece that was developed for the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. And it was a video performance work. Um, and a moon jar is a traditional Korean uh, vessel. Um, and I began to wonder uh, if this is a moon jar, where is the planet? And um, looking around the museum, I saw all of these Celadon ceramics and discovered that throughout the galleries, this was a recurrent theme. And so I have decided that Asian Americans come from planet Celadon <laughs> um, and are literal green people, okay? Um, and so I will show you a, a quick part of the trailer um, for this performance. <laughs> goes on. Uh, and um, uh, so I was supposed to actually produce a uh, performance this year uh, that got canceled because of COVID. Um, and I was asked to produce a video in lieu of the performance. Um, and uh, I've been thinking a lot about um, what Planet Solidon is as a space and um, have been building it out as a CG world. Um, the original performance was supposed to have uh, musicians that were scientists and they were searching for extraterrestrial life using various um, haptic electronic costumes and props. There were gonna be dancers. Um, but uh, so this piece 
uh, I'll just show you a little bit of this. And this is, uh, let's just, oh wait, nope, wrong one. There you go. Researchers found a new repeating mass gradient burst coming from the outskirts of a large star galaxy 500 million years away. Let's call some this. So it uses a lot of um, computer icons and um, things from computer games as a stand-in for language. Um, you know, just how we understand like the Apple Beach Ball as waiting and the clock ticking and then some of the sounds from computer, like the beepings and stuff like that. Here's the stop it there and then the rocket goes to earth and lands um, and uh, so I made this uh, the piece that's in the show like super super fast um, quarantine um, anxiety and stress and um, thinking a lot about um, screen life um, and a screen as a uh, as a world in and of itself and as the way that we are communicating these days um, and I'll just show a quick part of that, or, uh, using a lot of Google Earth and a lot of symbols. And then, like a home pod. Live translation. Mm -hmm. 
up to five minutes. <laughs> Great, Genevieve, thank you so much. And uh, the Rockettes and Celadon, I would, uh, I imagine visiting there. <laughs> 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 if I could get an invitation. Um, thank cool. you. <laughs> and Christina, you're next. Thanks, Carla. Yeah, let me just um, see if I can share my screen. And before I begin, I guess I should really just say I'm really stoked to be sharing my work um, on the same day as like lots of um, artists who uh, I know and love who are friends and whose work I found particularly inspiring. So um, I'm very happy about that. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I have been, um, I, I'm a research-based um, interdisciplinary artist. I have a video in the show and I have worked for a long time with a digital video installation. Um, but what I'm, some of the work that I'm gonna be showing um, right now um, with you guys um, is really kind of uh, not very, um, uh, not very kind of digital, it's in fact kind of reflecting more current uh, contemporary kind of uh, focuses um, uh, in my work which are kind of moving towards um, distinctly more analog media, um, kind of working a lot with paper and cardboard. Um, but basically I've been uh, making work about the histories of media and communication technology for about 10 years. Um, and I uh, kind of do a lot of research um, into these histories, uh, into these kind of like um, specifically visual and communications uh, technologies um, as a way to kind of think about how and why um, the media that we live with now have um, evolved, where have they come from, um, but also as a way to kind of think um, about how media have become important to us um, socially, politically, and culturally. Um, so on the one hand, I'm kind of really thinking about media and technology as uh, bridges that help us kind of navigate and connect with the world, right? Kind of, we're all thinking about this right now more than ever with, um, you know, all of the various technologies that we have to um, use now with Zoom, what have you to kind of stay connected with everyone um, in pandemic times. Um, but I'm also kind of thinking about media and technology as conduits for our historical imaginations um, and how they can kind of act as filters um, and expresses of our kind of hopes and fears about our, our like present contemporary um, moment. Um, so I just wanted to share like a couple of um, projects that I've worked on recently and then just I'll, I'll finish up by just mentioning one or two things about the video that I have in the show. Okay, so um, um, one of the kind of first paper-based projects, I kind of call them like paper media, kind of make your own kind of media um, projects, um, was uh, a project based on peat boxes. Um, and a lot of these projects are about kind of media history and kind of how we tell history, um, the kind of forms that kind of history telling has to take, the, the kind of um, making neat of history and trying to kind of complicate that in some way. So in some of these projects and particularly, the, I think this peat box, peat box project was the first project that I did this um, with, but I kind of uh, um, did a bunch of research into um, the peat box itself, which was, uh, I almost kind of see it as a, like a prehistory um, of, or it's one prehistory of kind of VR technologies. It's it's a little kind of medium that uh, is takes the form of a miniature theater. It's a kind of immersive, a kind of miniature immersive space 
that traditionally, and, and the peat box was kind of popular in the 17th to 19th centuries, but traditionally the peat box had been kind of used to celebrate um, certain kind of national achievements that were um, either kind of related to kind of monarchies or um, technological progress or um, engineering, that kind of thing. So they had a kind of very specific like nationalist bent to them. Um, but they also were kind of engaged in other, um, uh, in other uh, kind of imperialist and kind of colonialist projects too, in the inclusion of images of like, you know, quote unquote, exotic lands and peoples. So when I was going back to this particular um, object, um, I chose to kind of really uh, rethink, right, um, how far I wanted to kind of reconstruct it. Uh, and I chose to um, kind of uh, intercept or kind of um, uh, alter in some way uh, that reconstruction by um, uh, including um, contemporary content, right? So I'm not kind of trying to reproduce an accurate replica of this kind of historical medium, um, but rather kind of do something completely else and, and kind of um, uh, try and invert the ideologies that were traditionally associated with it. So with the peat boxes, for example, I um, uh, I filled them with images of kind of civil disobedience and um, kind of protest uh, that had been really present in the time that I was um, developing these um, peat boxes. And this is a kind of ongoing project. I have about six or seven peat boxes now, but certainly I'm kind of making, making more. Um, I have also recently been kind of moving into artist books uh, and um, this is a particular project where I kind of turn towards the, the thaumatrope, the kind of this little guy here, you know, this very, very simple um, technology that um, again, I kind of see taking a quite important place in terms of prehistories of like uh, virtual imagery. Um, see? Oh. oh. So, okay. Um, so, uh, so this was a book that really kind of came out of me doing research into the thaumatrope and kind of really wanting to um, kind of use this opportunity to really talk to the almost um, kind of keep them with the theme of, of the virtual, the, the kind of like spectral presence of women in histories of, of STEM. Um, so I developed this particular book that was about the history of computers and computers here being women uh, mathematicians um, who often worked in groups, right, to kind of figure out really complex math mathematical equations um, in the fields of like ballistics, astronomy, um, and in the 20th and 21st centuries computing itself. Um, so this is a book that actually invites interaction from its readers um, in that I kind of ask readers to um, kind of cut the book up and, and make these little guys and actually kind of spin them and um, kind of insert the women who are kind of represented on one side of the card into the kind of fields in which they worked, which um, I've kind of represented on the other side of the card through various imagery. So it also, it, it, it basically kind of becomes this like symbolic act of like reinserting um, those figures into those fields where they were not necessarily always recognized or acknowledged right for their work. Um, okay so this leads me to um, the video that I have chosen to include in the show and my apologies for um, the kind of overlap here with the partial imagery of the um, analytic engine there kind of covered um, but the, the video that I decided to put into this show, um, which is called The Difference Engine, um, is uh, a video that um, uh, was based on uh, what in media folklore has now kind of come to be known as like the, the world's first computer, or it often gets spoken about that way, um, Charles Babbage's analytic um, engine. And I, again, kind of following that path of like, um, histories of um, technologies of the virtual. I, I was really drawn to this particular machine because it's the, the machine itself was a kind of virtual machine. It was um, uh, designed by Babbage in the 1830s, but kind of remained 
just a set of schematics until the 21st century when a group of engineers kind of came together to reconstruct it. And I should have some yeah, little gifts here of the actual machine. I was really struck when I saw these images of just how beautiful and graceful this machine was. And um, I really kind of started to think about that, uh, the, the way that I could represent this machine uh, as a kind of complex um, assemblage of like virtual elements um, uh, and kind of piece it together in some way um, to kind of both really um, point back to its history, but also um, again, try to um, uh, uh, think about uh, how we tell kind of histories of media in more kind of complex ways, right? So um, how that has um, figured here, um, and I'm just gonna bring it forward, but I'll, I'll keep talking over the top. Um, how this is figured is that I, I've kind of created um, a kind of layered video in which I'm representing the schematics, Babbage's schematics, and um, uh, 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 videos of that kind of reconstruct the recent reconstruction of the machine. Um, and then I worked with um, the artist Renee Rhodes, um, wonderful Renee, um, who choreographed a set of movements um, in response to um, the, the movements of the machine itself. So I was trying to kind of create this like multi-layered um, historiographic text, right? That, that kind of acknowledges that, that machine's history, but also kind of is trying to kind of create enough space to connect that history to, um, uh, to, to the present, right? And to try and, and I feel like this is something that I've, I've always tried to do with um, many, many of my projects, certainly the projects that I've um, spoken about here, right, making that connection between the past and the present um, kind of clear, but then also kind of complicate it, right, and create space for disruption and kind of interruption and, and uh, the insertion of like new or alternate, right, or, or kind of speculative alternatives to what is often given as like a grand narrative or, um, you know, um, a kind of official um, history. And I think I should finish it there. I'm going way, way over. So apologies for that. Thank you so much, Christina. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> really fantastic work. And um, I, I'm really excited to see this new analog work, but still how you're, you know, mining these histories of the technology of the virtual and, and uh, you know, finding different um, instantiations. But not, but last not, but not least, David. And thank you all for still being here. David, we're so excited for you to be our last speaker today. Unless, I, you know what, David, one second. There might be some other artists here because I did leave this open. If anyone else who came today who hasn't given a talk, just message me. But now, David, you have the floor. Let's go. All right, thank you, Carla, and uh, thank you to uh, again to uh, Clark and Carla. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to participate in this show, um, and thank you. It's just been such a pleasure. I agree with Christina. Um, there are some uh, friends and uh, artists that I've been fans of for years, and it's just great to see everyone here. So um, I'll get started here. Um, okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. Um, hi, so uh, for those uh, that are uh, that uh, don't know me, uh, my name is David Bayes, and uh, my work uh, focuses primarily on experimental filmmaking. Um, and uh, the topics pertaining to my work usually uh, deal with the overlapping intersections between science and spirituality and theology um, in my uh, in my practice. Um, so I think uh, for for this talk, I'm just sort of I'm going to focus on uh, two works. Uh, one is uh, both our uh, video pieces. The first one is one that has been started since uh, we all went into lockdown in March and is uh, ongoing, uh, hopefully to be finished uh, later this winter. And the other one is the piece that I did for the show, which is in a lot of ways in my own research an offshoot of uh, my thinking and ideas behind uh, the piece that I'm still working on. Um, so 
me just jump to the next slide. Um, so in my in my sort of the early months of the pandemic, um, my focus really I would I would be working. I was working on a film project that I was going to be doing for a residency over the summer. Um, that got torpedoed after a couple of weeks. We went into lockdown, so. I didn't really know where I was going uh, practice wise on my next project where to pivot and I was spending late nights just sort of going down rabbit holes of just uh, different topics online, but I was becoming increasingly fascinated with what seemed to be this really renewed and virulent uh, topic of, of, of paranoia, uh, prophecy and um, uh, apocalypse, which just seemed to be, you know, this has been going on since, you know, forever, since the, since the early aughts, the 2012 and on, but really it's been taking on um, cultural and political strengths that I don't think we've seen before. And uh, I mean, for example, on the bottom right here, there was literally a apocalypse that was supposed to happen on my birthday in September 5th that never happened, <laughs> thankfully. But I was, you know, I was just fascinated with this and just like the sense of like paranoia and just the, the truth decay, if you will. Um, and usually in my own, and, and not only with that, but I was also dealing with my own uh, severe paranoid hypochondria. I'm a, I've been a hypochondriac since I was, I ran out of uh, the movie Outbreak when I was like 12 years old. It was, the, I ran out of it. Like it was like my first movie I ever ran out of. Um, so just wrestling with all these things. And it, and it, I was like, okay, well, you know, in these, in these times where it's like you don't you know not trying to pivot on what to do i was like well i'm just going to go with what what i'm going with at the moment and that led me to uh start a film project which i'm working on right now uh which i'm just saying starting to get close to finishing up called the very in transit um and it focuses on a uh character that is uh set in a uh a, a pandemic stricken world and he for lack of a better terms is the only person in this world, but he is dealing with his own uh, paranoia and disassociation. And, and in this project, I decided to take like these sort of ghostly ideas of like visions of, of fear and paranoia and create characters out of them. And, uh, and I'll get a little bit more into what the storyline is about that. But um, uh, the, the basic story is that this man is mourning his dead family and the survivor of a global pandemic. He is attempting to find a cure while suffering from disassociation and paranoia. And to do so, he must decipher reality and his life from his own dreams, delusions, and perceptions of fear. Um, so that was sort of a piece that, I, that I'm working on right now. And the fun part about it for me was like trying to take all the sort of psychi psychiatric uh, uh, diagnoses of, of these like certain mental, uh, mental conditions and create, turning them into characters or uh, props or, or uh, set props in a way. So um, a big part of this project for me that's been rather satisfying has been, uh, you know, just sort of throughout all the different sets in the film, um, uh, just making uh, signs and uh, sort of paranoid voices in my head represented as as uh, signage. So like, you know, just little, like uh, the funnest part for me was I was able to recreate uh, a, a full BART train, um, which at the moment is where I think probably I'm most fearful to go is in the subway. Um, so I just started with like, okay, let's start it on a BART train. So um, on the top right here, you can see I, I reproduced um, a BART sign with uh, th these, these sort of paranoid, fearful messages kind of like radiating at the character. Um, garbage, uh, newspaper, all have these specific messages kind of beating this theme over and over of uh, this sort of fearful it that isn't really quite defined but is perpetually sort of coming um so that's just been something that i've been uh you know working on over the over the few months um an interesting part of disassociation uh that is kind of goes hand in hand with paranoia um is that uh you you lose a sense of time and i like the i like taking sort of certain topics and extrapolating them to extremes so uh, as the film progresses, we really see sort of time collapse on, in on itself. There's scenes towards the end where we're uh, reaching like Neolithic uh, uh, 
elements going on with like woolly mammoths and uh, Australopithecus and different uh, uh, elements from w different uh, different times all sort of collapsing in on one another. Um, again, just more of these different bits of details and signs that I've been putting um, in the background here. This is another clip of just something where I'm just creating a giant collage wall that's going on the back of this scene here. That's all just, and it's been interesting just researching all just the media saturation that sort of permeates uh, fear. And it led me down this weird road where I was starting to think about um, paranoia and then it led me to schizophrenia. And this is where it branches off into sort of the project that I, I did for this piece um, where I was starting to think about almost like how uh, the microbiotic, the, the viruses, the microbes are actually in a lot of ways the drivers of our human behavior, of the narratives that we build. These big overarching uh, stories are driven by these very small things, uh, these very tiny things. Um, and just before I jump into uh, the where where my thinking for this project led to the project that I'm, uh, I did for uh, Archive to Come. I'll show a brief sort of clip here of, uh, of the film. This is just a real short kind of clip um, preview here. So let me know if you can't hear the, uh, the audio. <laughs> Um, okay, so I won't go, I didn't want that to go on too long. Um, so, so again, I, I was thinking, you know, like taking basically uh, what I was feeling, what I felt like the, the sort of cultural themes at large at the moment are going about of, of, of fear and paranoia and taking them and putting them into uh, this narrative, which is uh, uh, something that I, 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 uh, I will be curious to see how it looks at, at the end. It seems sometimes to be changing from day to day. But um, while I was working on that, I, I was researching just the topic of schizophrenia in general and specifically this interesting uh, area that I found um, uh, where there is a lot of uh, medical research in how what's called dysbiosis, which is a imbalance of the microbial bacteria in the stomachs of humans uh, is associated with uh, mental disorders, uh, specifically de uh, uh, depression, um, uh, paranoia, uh, schizophrenia, and addiction. Um, and that was really interesting to me because I felt like so much in just the, in a cultural sense of these, these small uh, unseeable forces were, were, were controlling and driving our lives um, very similar to uh, how devout people feel like, like the spirit of of God can drive uh, their lives, but these unseeable, unknowable things um, were, were driving our lives. So, so I went down my own little rabbit hole and around this time, uh, I'd been invited by uh, Caroline Clark to participate in the show. And I was thinking, oh, I wanted to do something specific for the show. And I had this idea in my head that wasn't specifically about, uh, you know, this, this piece kind of was, had its own 
trajectory. So I was like, okay, I like this idea of dysbiosis and uh, microbes and bacteria driving driving human behavior. So um, I was going in through research and um, I, I found these really interesting sort of weird connections. Um, I, I realized, and I didn't know this at the time, that hypochondria, which I horrifically suffer from, um, was is is in the original Greek uh, means uh, hypochondria means below the sternum, like below the ribs. So it literally means like like below the sternum in your stomach. Um, and I thought that was very interesting. And then um, to the right is uh, 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 Marshall Applewhite, which uh, was a schizophrenic uh, Christian, pseudo-Christian uh, uh, with a space theme cult leader, which I think most people here are very familiar with. But um, as a child, I was fascinated with him because I, I, I was obsessed with the Hale-Bopp comet. And that was the first time I'd ever heard about cults in general and so he was just sort of the where my mind first went. David I oh, just yeah. want to yeah um maybe like two more minutes and wrap it up oh yeah uh, sure, I okay. know you waited till the end but just so that we keep it sure 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 okay I can totally yeah. thank you um so anyways um that sort of thinking led me to think of like okay uh, how um thinking about mental behaviors led me to thinking about uh Cartesian theaters and I thought I want to do a piece that was a representation of the uh, my, uh, a Cartesian theater of the guts of the microbiome which drives human behavior. Um, the the sort of like iconic Fritz Kahn uh, illustration of the Cartesian theater is like the uh, the, the the human mind with a person looking at a projection of the outside in in the headspace. So um, I sort of took that as my inspiration to make the piece. Uh, that is in this show, uh, Dysbiotic Prophets. Um, so um, the piece itself uh, was, I wanted to create sort of a, um, uh, a video, terminal, video terminal connected to this uh, fleshy intestinal cord uh, where you have this mirror egg-like node that responds to this external stimuli. Um, and the, uh, the, the sequence begins as this colorful display of microbial movement, Pleasant chatter echoes in the background, and I'm realizing I'm running out of time. So what I'll do instead of describing that, I will just uh, play a brief clip of it, not the entirety, um, and then we'll 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 call it. <laughs> The reason this is such an interesting time is not only because we're on the threshold of the end of this civilization, because it's about to be recycled, but because of where that finds us, where that finds you, where that finds those who would judge us, how we would speak of them and how they would speak of us. Okay, so um, just to end, so this piece uh, at large was, was, was sort of just focused on my interest in how uh, microbes can affect uh, personal human behavior, creating uh, prophecy and hysteria and paranoia, but also how that mental thinking then has its own sort of virulency and can then through, through digital media, through video, uh, be projected outward into the larger sort of macroscopic macrobiome, the human animal at large. Um, so anyways, uh, that, that's, uh, that's my time. Um, so thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks again to Carla and Clark for inviting me to be in the show. David, thank you so much. And thank you. I know, you know, to, to, to be the last speaker, <laughs> it's, you know, always, a, it's difficult, but thank you so much. And you encapsulated quite a bit in uh, the time that you presented. Um, fantastic work. So Clark, we have been going for two hours. You know, normally we'll, we'll have some questions or closing remarks, um, but I, I don't like to keep people on a, um, one Zoom call for too long. So Clark, do you want to just, you know, take five, 
five minutes to add your closing remarks or, or any responses? Oh, well, gosh. Um, I have a whole uh, notebook full of questions I know, here. I know. Um, that is, um, that's frustrating to me. This was a real powerhouse of a panel today and uh, really appreciate all your uh, contributions and the way in which the work, um, again, sort of spoke uh, across the conversations and echoed each other and um, developed in different directions. Um, if I start asking questions, though, uh, we would go on for a while, I suppose. Um, are we just going to not do that, Carla? Well, we can, I, when we started I mean, the words, talk the presentations, today. yeah, the presentations merit the questions, but uh, yeah, we, do. I guess I can say, I guess I can say thank you. Um, and we really appreciate your contributions and uh, your participation today. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to follow up and uh, talk further sometime. And thank you to everybody who uh, logged on. And we will uh, have a recording of this uh, presentation today uh, on the website uh, before the end of the next week. And uh, we'll announce that on our website and social media. So uh, the show's up for another uh, two weeks. I hope that you will spread the word and uh, point people to the work um, while it's still available. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank Claire. you, everyone. Thank you for your generous uh, presentations. It was amazing. Have a great rest of the weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.